how can it be that this man has seen a site that shouldn't exist, the fabulous canals of Mars? Can this crater on the dark side of the moon explain a mystery handwritten in this book eight centuries ago? Does this glass plate hold the secret of the lost planet Vulcan? And can this computer crack the oldest astronomical riddle of all? What was the star of Bethlehem? Mysteries from the files of Arthur C. Clarke, author of 2001 and inventor of the communication satellite. Now in retreat in Sri Lanka, after a lifetime of science, space and writing, he ponders the riddles of this and other worlds. Astronomy is the oldest of the sciences. Since time immemorial, men have looked up at the starry skies and tried to unravel their secrets. Even now, our giant telescopes are discovering new and baffling phenomena at the very edge of the visible universe. I sometimes think that the universe is a machine designed for the perpetual astonishment of astronomers. Beside the new discoveries, there are also several classical astronomical mysteries which even now intrigue and baffle scientists. Dr. Peter Boyce is on his way to the birthplace of the astronomical world's most sensational story. This is Mars Hill, where the drama of the canals of Mars was nurtured and disseminated to an astonished world. It was 1894 when construction began here on an observatory. It had been specially commissioned by Percival Lowell, a Boston millionaire who developed a passionate taste for astronomy. These maps, which Lowell believed showed canals on the planet Mars, were drawn a few years earlier by an Italian astronomer, Giovanni Schiaparelli. They inspired in Lowell a lifelong obsession. He built his own observatory in the clear and steady air above the Wild West town of Flagstaff in Arizona. His aim to be ready for the close approach of Mars to the Earth due in the autumn of 1894. Peter Boyce, an executive of the American Astronomical Society, has come to Mars Hill because he, like Lowell, had an odd vision of Mars. In October 1894, Percival Lowell settled down to await his encounter with the Red Planet. Night after night, Lowell and his uh, assistants at the telescope here sat and made drawing after drawing of the uh, markings that they saw on the surface of the planet. They saw the broad, dark markings that uh, everybody at that time saw. But in addition, they saw these marvelous, long, straight, uh, thin lines that Lowell called canals. We have a series of drawings made by Lowell and a number of his associates which show these, uh, very definitely show a number of these uh, canals and the notation saw no end of canals. In fact, so many could not single them out enough to draw them. Lowell constructed globes to show the canals he saw. 
There were dark blobs too. These he called oases. In later years, his maps became even more intricate with all the canals named. And he was fascinated by the way the canals seemed to grow from the polar ice caps each Martian summer. Lowell evolved the grandest and most romantic of theories. The canals were built by Martians to channel water from the ice caps because their planet was drying up. The Martians were battling to stave off inevitable doom. Soon Mars mania was everywhere. The newspapers vied with one another for the most realistic view of life on Mars. And this is from a serious book on astronomy. In this desperate battle for life, signals from the Martians were supposedly detected. From the changing shadows of the planet's surface, an interplanetary Morse code of dots and dashes. Lowell proclaimed that the Earth likewise was doomed to die from drought. His own death came as the canal craze declined, but the idea was never quite buried. In 1964, the moment of truth with a space probe, destination Mars. It found a desolate and lifeless planet, not a trace of canals. Yet Lowell's lines are still occasionally glimpsed. One night in 1971, Peter Boyce was observing Mars through the Cerro Tololo telescope in Chile. On that night, the amount of detail that was visible on the surface of Mars was just incredible. The big dark marking Sirtis Major was darker than I've ever seen it before. It looked like the black pit of hell. I saw many of the uh, oases all over the surface of the planet. You could see these small dark markings. I saw at least one of the canals that I recognized, the uh, Thoth Canal, was extremely visible. Without question, it was there, it was standing out. I have to conclude that there is something on the surface of the planet and that Lowell was indeed actually seeing something that, that was there. Whether or not it was a series of dots or a, uh, uh, these, this network of fine lines as he actually drew it, I think it must be one of the mysteries that remains. We're repeating an experiment here that was conducted at the turn of the century to try and settle this question. What we have on the blackboard is a rather conventionalized drawing of Mars showing the dark and light areas that everybody agrees exist, but no canals, no linear features. These girls don't know what they're drawing. They haven't seen that in close-up. And we've asked them to draw exactly what it is they see. And we're waiting to see what the result of this experiment is. You, you. This experiment carried out in Trincomalee, Sri Lanka, some 80 years after it was first done in England, shows very clearly that the human eye has a tendency to link up patterns, to create patterns where they don't exist. And some of these drawings are pretty much like levels. I, I, I one here, thin, very thin lines, which aren't, aren't on the original drawing at all. And symmetrical patterns. Again, nothing like the original object. So I'm sure what happened in the case of Lowell was that he linked, his eye linked together the various dots and smudges on Mars and saw this gridwork of lines which looked so artificial and which we now know is not there at all. The canals of Mars aren't the only thing to have gone missing in the history of astronomy. A whole planet has disappeared. It was in central France that in a classic confrontation, the planet Vulcan was born. Now Richard Baum, an English astronomer, has come to the village of Orgère to investigate its death. Central characters in the drama were Edmond Lascarbo, a country doctor who loved astronomy. His adversary, the celebrated Professor Le Verrier, honored by King Louis Philippe for predicting the discovery of Neptune. Their meeting, which was for a time to make Auger internationally famous, grew out of strange irregularities in the orbit of the planet Mercury, 
which was disobeying Newton's laws of physics. Professor Le Verrier proposed this was due to the pull of an unknown planet between Mercury and the Sun. And one afternoon in 1859, Dr. Lescarbo thought he saw it in the skies above Orgères. He was in his observatory studying the sun when he saw a small black spot move onto its face. It took four hours to cross the sun. When Le Verrier heard about this, he caught the first train from Paris and marched the 12 miles from the station to Lescarbo's door. Now, when Le Verrier came up to the door, he rapped rather imperiously on it. He was, by all accounts, a rather arrogant, haughty, stiff sort of character, who had little time for his subordinates. Anyhow, the door was shortly opened by a very small, meek, somewhat self-effacing fellow, Dr. Lescarbo himself. Without introducing himself, Le Verrier said, it is you, sir, who claims to have seen or discovered the intramercurial planet. I warn you, sir, I have come to either unmask you as an imposter or to prove you as the true discoverer of this object. He then asked to see the Scarbo's calculations, because the Scarbo had mentioned something about the distance of the planet from the sun. And this proved to be almost farcical in its way, because the Scarbo admitted to being rather a poor man and that he could scarcely afford to buy paper so that, therefore, he was used to doing his calculations on pieces of wood and to erase them, of course, simply to plane them off, which was rather economic, I suppose. Well, this seemed to upset Le Verrier altogether. But somehow, there was something about the way in which Le Scarbot recounted his experience which convinced him, at least, that here was an honest man and that the observation had been genuinely made. Accordingly, he named the new object, which astounded the world because of its major importance, Vulcan. Yet from the start, Vulcan had a question mark hanging over it. Some amateurs saw it, like this American railway engineer who wrote, a small boy asked me what was the matter with the sun. On looking at it, I saw a planet. But no professional observed it until 1878, time of a great eclipse in the United States. Professor James Craig Watson's party stationed themselves at separation in Wyoming. During totality, he spotted an unknown object near a known star. So did one of his colleagues in Colorado. But Vulcan has never been seen again. Vulcan officially died in 1915 with the publication of Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity. His concept of gravitation predicted that Mercury would move exactly in the way it was being observed to move. Very simply because Albert Einstein predicted that bodies moving in a high gravitational field would move somewhat differently to that predicted by Isaac Newton's theory of gravitation. So accordingly, with the publication of his theory in 1915, Vulcan officially died and the search for the holy grail, so to speak, in the skies died. But has it been buried? Dr. Henry Corton of Dowling College on Long Island, New York, has, with Professor Don Albert, taken ultra-high-powered photographs of the sun during eclipses. Among the familiar stars on the negative plates, they've discovered what they think are objects a few miles across swirling around the sun. The objects occupy essentially the same position in the sky relative to the sun that the early reports of Vulcan did record. Vulcan uh, perhaps did exist. And then you have to explain what happened to it. Why, do, why do, don't we see Vulcan anymore? And uh, uh, things just don't fly off, uh, but they could disintegrate. And uh, being so close to the sun, uh, it would experience strong gravitational forces. and. Uh, perhaps did not survive, and now is in smaller fragments in that vicinity. There was an object. It was observed by a number of people and recorded in the proper position. And here we are, uh, on the order of 100 years later, finding a bunch of debris in the area. It seems a straightforward uh, conclusion to make, that the two are directly related. We're looking at the leftovers of Vulcan. 
A different kind of celestial conundrum lies in the library built by Sir Christopher Wren at Trinity College in Cambridge. It's in the Chronicle of Gervais, a book written in the 12th century by a monk from Canterbury. Jack Harting, an American space scientist, discovered that on one page was a mysterious report handwritten eight centuries ago in Latin. What this uh, says when translated into English is that on a particular evening in the year 1178, uh, June 18th to be exact, uh, there were at least five men uh, sitting and observing a new moon and just after sunset, the new moon was visible, and they observed that the upper horn of a new moon, the upper horn is the language that's used in the, in the text, split. And from this division point came fire, uh, hot coals, and sparks. Uh, quite a remarkable thing to observe, I think. Uh, and the text goes on to say that uh, this uh, moon, which they saw, uh, writhed as if it were a wounded snake. Harting followed the trail back to Kent. The moon this evening looks much as it must have looked on that evening of June 18th, 1178, some 802 years ago. It's a very thin crescent appearing on the, above the western horizon just after sunset. The fact that it was a new moon recorded in the Chronicle gave Hartung his clue. The midpoint of the upper horn of a new moon uh, corresponds to a, a latitude of 45 degrees north. Uh, the new moon itself indicates that the longitude of, of the site of such an event was 90 degrees east. And from that, we can predict that there should be something observable on the surface of the moon, some scar to represent uh, what actually happened that evening. From the Earth, nothing is now visible. But, wondered Harting, could the witnesses have seen the effects of something out of sight, just over the rim, on the dark side of the moon? And in just the right place, on pictures taken by orbiting spacecraft, he found this meteor crater, 13 miles across, named Giordano Bruno. Most significant, the network of bright rays told Hartung the impact was fresh. He's convinced this is the explanation of Gervais's story, a unique sighting. So those five men who witnessed the formation of Giordano Bruno on that evening of June 18th in 1178 are almost certainly the only five men in recorded history to have observed such a significant, fantastic event. I think we should take this observation seriously because after all, there were many tremendous meteor impacts on the moon in the remote past. This is a mystery which we'll solve one day when we go back to the moon and explore it thoroughly. There are almost too many possible answers to the other classic astronomical mystery, what was the star of Bethlehem? After seeing the star in the east, according to St. Matthew, the wise men journeyed to Jerusalem. The star went before them and stood over where the young child was in Bethlehem. The star is now a central image of Christmas. But was it a miracle or a myth? Could it have been a real astronomical event? Chinese writings drawn up 2,000 years ago suggested one answer to astronomer Dr. Richard Stevenson. There were star records made for the emperors of China. Scholars think that Christ was born sometime between 8 and 4 BC. What I did was to cover about the range from about 10 BC to 10 AD and see whether there were any new stars since a star seems to be the most obvious uh, interpretation, uh, visible around this period. And there, in the Chenping period, 5 BC, was an unusual entry. Here, this is uh, what it says. In the second year of the rain period, second month, this is a lunar month, so this is about March to April, a Huaixing, 
that's a, normally a broom star or a common, appeared. And it gives the a little constellation in which it occurred, that's in Chen Yu. And it says, furthermore, it was visible for more than 70 days. Stevenson believes the account refers not to a comet, which moves quite quickly across the sky, but to a nova, or exploding star, since the Chinese scribes mention no movement. But a rival theory has it that the Magi were astrologers, and that the star was a symbolic coming together of planets. Dr. David Hughes has programmed a computer to recreate the night sky as it was 2,000 years ago. My theory is that the star of Bethlehem was Jupiter. And the event that Jupiter was in at the time was a coming together with Saturn, another planet, in the constellation of Pisces. Here you see the stars in Pisces. And these stars represent the tails of the two fishes. When anything happens in here, when any planets start to move around, the astrologers in those days would have automatically connected this movement with events that were occurring in Palestine. The Earth's movement around the Sun makes Saturn and Jupiter appear to move strangely in the sky. Just once every 805 years, this causes what's known as a triple conjunction in Pisces. This happened in 7 BC. The planet Saturn is the one of astrologically is the, the planet of the god, and Jupiter is the planet of the new messiah. And what is happening in 7 BC is we're getting a coming together of these two planets, which is indicating that the rule of that land is being transferred from the god to the new messiah. Here we have the date and Saturn moving into the frame first of all. Here we have Jupiter following Saturn. And of course, as the date changes, you can see them moving across the screen. And you get, on the 29th of May in 7 BC, the first conjunction where the two planets come close together. The wise men would have been convinced at this time that something really important was happening in Palestine and that the ruler of the Jews, the new ruler of the Jews, is going to come. We can continue and you will now see the date moving, the planets move apart, and will then come together again in September. And this will be the second conjunction. And during that time, between May and September, the Magi would have been moving from Babylon across the desert, and would be continually looking at these stars in the sky with the planets moving among them. And these two coming together would be reinforcing their predictions. Now we can continue on to the third conjunction, and you will notice that again, as time progresses, the two planets move slightly apart, and then in December, we'll come together again for the third time, and here on the 4th of December, we have them again separated by about one degree. Hughes believes that just before this third conjunction, the wise men saw Herod, and that his priests said the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Now, of course, the interesting thing here is that you're really dealing all the time with two very normal planets moving against a very normal constellation. And the astrologers, the wise men of Babylon, would have regarded this as very significant. But Herod and the man in the street would have just thought two planets moving. And Herod was very surprised when the Magi came to him and said, we have seen his star in the east. Where is this new messiah? Such a celestial lineup is of no particular astronomical importance. But it may have been of great significance to the astrologers who flourished in those days, as unfortunately they still do. For a serious astronomical explanation of the star of Bethlehem, well, my favorite theory is that it was a supernova. Occasionally, a star may explode with a violence so great that for a few weeks, it outshines all the other stars in the sky. No human eye has seen such a thing for 350 years. The next supernova is rather overdue. As its furies fade, a supernova may become a pulsar, a tiny star emitting immensely powerful radio waves. Now, as it happens, quite recently, a pulsar has been located with the rather glamorous name of PSR 
1913 plus 16B has been discovered, which seems to fit the specifications of the Star of Bethlehem. How romantic if even now we can hear the dying voice of the star which heralded the Christian era.